Howdy, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cowboys in the Osage from right here at the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum located in historic Pahuska, Oklahoma. Hey, I'm Cody Boy. I got my host, co-host over here, old Jimbo, my rodeo historian. What's going on, Jimbo, and who do we got today? Not much, Cody. We've got a real special guest today. He was a 10-time Steer Open National Finalist, two-time National Finalist average winner, Runner up for the world twice, once by as little as $94, one of the closest races ever at that time. He won Pendleton twice, won San Angelo twice, won the Ben Johnson, won High Endless Nebraska twice, Miles City, Montana, uh, McAllister, Oklahoma. He's the only guy to win the Laramie King Merritt Roping three times, 61, 62, and 63. And, uh, of course, I'm talking about my Uncle Joe, Joe Snively, Lusk, Oklahoma. Joe, that's a that's a lot, quite a resume there. How'd you win all that? Just lucky? Just lucky. One of the greatest of all time, Joe Snively, right here at the table with us in Pahuska today. Joe, second generation cowboy, rodeo cowboy. What was it like growing up in the rodeo world with your dad? The world, the world champion Jim Snively, for everybody that don't know, is his dad, 1956, steer open world champion Jim Snively. Well, one thing, we did a lot of traveling, or it seemed like we did, and uh, it was wonderful. He had taught me how to rope. And... How did y'all travel in those days? It's a little bit different nowadays than it was back then. Yeah. It's a lot different. We had a car, he did, and we just traveled. They didn't have a lot of trucks back then, you know, it was mostly cars. So what kind of trailers were you guys pulling back then? Most of them was homemade. Did you guys make your own? Yeah. So when you get to the rodeos, what would y'all do? Um, Nowadays, you know, everybody plugs their trailers in and they've taken to the fancy stalls and they feed their horses and water their horses. So, and then, uh, you know, a little bit before that, everybody went to the motel or they had a camper on the back of their truck. So what was it like when you got to the rodeo in those early days with your dad and family? Uh, a lot of time you camped out and uh, then you'd go to a motel and stay. and uh, But... The rodeos back in, when I was going with my dad, they would be a week or two us apart, and you would go to, and you'd stay at a rodeo two or three days after it was over with, and then you'd go to the next one, you may have to stay two or three days before it started, and they did a lot of cooking out. Would everybody get together, everybody be there like a social event cooking out or would it just be a, a family well, to family type of thing? It would be both. Sometimes there would be three or four families or somebody that wasn't married would come in and eat and stay. What about up there in Calgary? Did you ever ride with your dad up there to watch him rope or anything? Yeah, I was up there one time and most I remember about it the World Fair was up there and uh, they had given away some puppies and I know I put my name down three or four times a day until Calgary was over with never did win one? But I never did win one I imagine my dad paid them not to let me win a puppy <laughs> what about Cheyenne growing up did you go up there with your dad ever? Yes, we went up there several times, and back in it was so uh, something was going on all the time, and you had to watch to keep from getting run over or or hurt. Was it chuck wagon races or what were they having? Yeah, they had chuck wagon races, and back in they just took horses off the track. And they'd never been hooked up to a wagon. And they loved to run off and run over anything that was in their way. Pretty wild event, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Hmm. 
Do they still have Chuck Wagon Races, Cody, up there? You know, I think they took the Chuck Wagon Races out just a few years ago. I, it seems like a few years ago. It might be 25 years ago now, Jimbo. Yeah. I don't know, because they got to having them at tonight shows. They had the barrel racing, Chuck Wagon, and everything after the rodeo was over. Now I think they have concerts and mm-hmm. sometimes right. they got a bull ride at night up there and all kinds of different things. It's been a few years since I've been up there. I'm kind of out of the, the loop. but Right, right. I always got a soft spot in my heart for that rodeo right. for sure. For right. sure. What about any of the big rodeos back east? Boston or Madison Square Garden? Any of those great big ones? Chicago growing up. Did you go to, to any of those with your dad? Yeah, I went to several of them when I was little. I remember being in New York. And we went to Empire State Building. That was the tallest building back then in the world. What, did they just have a bunch of pins and stuff back there? Was New York not quite as congested as it is now? How did they keep all the stock around there in that big city? They built pins under the stadium and some outside. Because it seemed like those rodeos lasted for quite a while. Yeah, it was almost a month. It was unreal. If you took your kids back there, they had to tutor them and stuff because it was during the school year. That was a problem. That's why I think they just got to go a time or two to New York because it was during the school year. Yeah. And it lasted so long. But But, when I was back there, I I wasn't in school. Yeah, you were younger. (laughs) Yeah. Where were you raised up around? Where were you raised? Uh, Right West of Pahuska, out here about eight and a half miles. Out where the old Snively Barn used to be before it fell down, you know. Yeah. Yes, sir, just, that, just that was, west of town there. Yeah, that was the home place. That's a real famous barn. It's been in quite a few movies and things I've, mm-hmm. yeah. I've seen. Yeah, I hate to see it fall down finally. I, I did, too. I didn't think it ever would. Yeah, I know. It was did all that for all that yeah. many years. Yeah, they had two houses out there. Of course, I was three when we moved away. They had two houses out there and had a rope and arena. Run north and south there, didn't it, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, I can barely remember it. Growing up up there with a good roping arena, I bet a lot of good ropers came to yeah. practice with you guys yeah, as you were growing up. There was a lot of ropers, different ropers. Everett Shaw come there, I crewed, and, and Ben Johnson come there, and there was just several different good ropers that come there. When you were a kid, would you get out there and rope with them, or did they just have you work in the chute? What 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 did they have you doing there as you were growing up? Uh, mostly in the way, but uh, I helped put cattle in the chute, and, and, and like I said, mostly in the way. When did they fir- When did they finally say, Joe, it's time for you to learn to rope? I was 12 or 13. I wrote dummies and this and that all before that, but before I got on a horse, I went to roping calves, and then when I was about 15, I went to tying steers down. Were there, did you, when did you start entering for money? Uh... I think I was 17, 16 or 17. First time you went to Cheyenne, Joe, to rope at Cheyenne, I guess it was the first time. You, I know your birthday's in July, so you would have just barely turned 17 in 1958 and you went to Cheyenne. And Tell us what happened up there. Well, uh, I tied my first steer down pretty good. I don't remember how long it was. I come back and drew another steer. There's big, tall cattle. And you couldn't really see the steer with all the others in there. And I remember riding in the box and looking at this black steer, and he was as big as my horse. He was as tall as my horse, and he was just as wide. (laughs) And I told myself, he's big enough to jerk my horse down. And I thought, no, this old horse is experienced enough. And I tied him in 18-something, placed him in a go-around, and put me first in the average at Cheyenne. My last steer uh, strained just a little bit, and I sort of froze up and never went ahead and tied him. And I tied him and got beat one-tenth of a second. 
you said you just pulled back on the string there just enough to to lose i mean you know, yeah to, to let, yeah who, who beat you that year everett shaw yeah he'd beat a lot of them hadn't he yes he has so growing up you get to roping you get to entering were there any kind of novice ropings for you to enter in the steer roping back then or when you first started entering it was against everett shaw and your dad and all the rest of the greats well when i first started uh you had everett shaw Schultz webster clark mcintyre and my dad they was considered the best back then you always had sonny davis he was a little younger but and you never did beat Sonny Davis. You had to let Sonny Davis beat himself. And then Don McLaughlin come along, and old and young come along, and they was just about as tough as anybody that ever run up and down the road. So from the start, you are roping against these guys. You didn't have to... Like they have now, you know, out at the, the Osage Club, they have the A, oh, B, yeah. and the C, yeah. the open, it, the it intermediate, like and the beginners. So you had to be pretty good to uh, start entering right then, too. I mean, he was roping against the best in the world yeah. right off the bat. Right, absolutely. Right off the bat. I, I remember one story. My dad told it. Went to Laramie, you probably 17, and Hyde Merritt, who put on the rope, and there's a King Merritt Memorial, and he entered you, wanted to enter you. And, and you went and roped four or five steers about as good as you could at that time and and I think you won fifth in the rope because Jim Clark and Shot and Everett Shaw won first, second, third and fourth, you know. <laughs> well Clark won it and Shot and my dad won second and third and Shaw won fourth. And you won fifth? And I won about fifth. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't pay much. Yeah. But but you were just a kid. Well, let's, Joe, let's move ahead then. Uh, early in 1959, when did you first hear about they might have a national final steer open? Well, we heard some talk about it, but nobody was sure for over the year was over half over before they said that they were going to have the finals. Yeah. Somebody, you said somebody stopped by the house and told you? Uh, or were they yeah, just talking? Ju Junior Turner and another cowboy, and I don't remember who the cowboy was, stopped by and they said they're going to have the finals. Yeah. Were you excited about it? Was it just another roping, or what did the people think about it? Well, you was a little excited, but it was just another roping. Right. Right. So you... Went ahead and made the finals that year. You were roping good. Even though you were just 18, you were roping like a house of fire and uh, made the finals. Jim made the finals. My dad was 16th that year, and uh, they called him before you left and told him to come bring a horse and come because he said somebody would probably drop out. So that made you have to take two rigs out there, didn't it? Because the best we had was a two-horse trailer, right? Yeah. So I guess you, you took your rig and... And we all, Jim and my dad, went in the car and took a two-horse trailer and took old Rock and the black horse out there, and you took the I sorrow took, horse, uh, old, yeah. old Jim. Yeah. When we say old Jim, that was the name of Joe's horse. And, of course, the dad, his dad's name was Jim, and then my dad was Jimmy, but there are a lot of Jims there. Your yeah. family likes the, the name did. Jim, obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Well, yeah. Carl Sawyer owned this old horse, and my dad trained him, and I rode him and. That's what Carl Sawyer called him, was Jim. Because Jim trained him? Yeah, because Jim trained him. I didn't know that. So, leading in that year of 1959 of the first national finals rodeo and the first national finals steer roping, did you and your dad and your brother all travel together to the rodeos? Uh, most of the time back in. Did, did two of you all ride the same horse? Or? Yeah. Yeah, we usually rode the same horse and... Until I got old Jim, I rode over the first year at Cheyenne, uh, I rode his old black horse. He was a good one. Yeah. Well, so here you are, you're, you're loading up and going to Clayton, New Mexico, and, and we don't have the weather forecast now like 
or then, back then like they do now, and you sure don't have New Mexico's weather forecast. No, they didn't so, have the weather channel. They didn't, yeah. did they even have channels or the app on then. your phone, you know. So Channel 6 didn't give New Mexico weather. So what did you take out there for clothes? Not very many. We had a light coat, and I remember I got out there and was running the cattle on a Friday evening, and you just wore your slurps. Yeah, slurps yeah, it was sleeves. pretty pretty on Friday, wasn't it? Yes, it was probably seventy five, hmm. and uh, I was wearing a I don't know why a navy cap, kind of a stocking cap, a it? stocking cap, and and a official from my RCA come told me that I was going to have to get a cowboy hat. I said no, I probably won't have to. I was giving them a bad time, and they was giving me a bad time. You knew him well. It was Joe Crow Jr. and Carl Arnold and, you know, guys like that you knew. And you Chuck know, Shepard. You, and yeah. It's an Atma. And we got up the next morning, and it was snowing and sleeting. And everybody went, and they bought out everything that was in the, every store that they had that was warm. Where did Jim find that cat? Did he take that with him? Or? Nope. That was in one of the stores out there. Cody, I'd like to read something here. Willard Porter wrote this years ago. He was there. And he was a great rodeo historian, wrote several books, and uh, wrote for the Western Horsemen, the uh, uh, Hoof and Horns, the Rodeo News. And this was in the Rodeo News years later. And this is how he described the weather. For sheer torture, I don't believe there's ever been a roping like it. We've all seen dust so thick you could carve it and use it as topping for a cake. We've seen hailstones as big as golf balls. We've seen tornadoes touch down here and there along rodeo arenas. In one spring in Clovis, New Mexico, they roped the last go around in an eight inch soup of mud and rainfall. But this one was cold, honest to goodness cold, hard, severe, chilling cold, the kind of cold that eats right through you, all over you at once. It was the worst roping weather-wise I've seen in nearly 30 years of reporting on such functions. So that just tells you kind of what they were dealing with. It was the worst one Willard Porter had ever seen or heard of. Wheeler didn't like it very good there. No, I don't think so. But uh, so the, you got up the next morning and the weather hit you, and uh, and you was mad scramble to to get clothes and everybody. Probably fighting over that last last stocking cap, but you had you were smart. You took a stocking cap with you. That you got the last laugh there. They were wanting you to wear a cowboy. There probably weren't very many cowboy hats that day, was it? Yeah, I mean, and a lot of people, and this and that, especially the team ropers that come from California, and this and that. A lot of their rigs froze up. And they was pulling them all over town. It was so cold. And uh, we left, if you left any, they had a good barn, and if you left any water in your bucket while we was roping, it froze solid. Mm -hmm. And you rope going north, and you rope right into it. Yeah. Huh. Well, my dad, getting back to my dad, he, he got out there and nobody dropped out, so they put him, they felt bad asking him to come out there, so they put him working to shoot. And paid him a hundred dollars a day, which is pretty good money in '59, you know. Oh yeah. And uh, but he was probably the coldest guy there, sitting up on that tractor seat, looking in that wind, wasn't he, Joe? Yeah, he and was. Th he told me all he had on was a jacket and two pair of pants and two sh shirts, you know. But I don't even think he had he had a cowboy hat on. That's all he yeah. had. So he had about freeze to death. Well, he had a double bad, didn't he, Jimbo? Did he, I wonder if he had to help uh, run the shoot for the team rope? Yeah, he did. So. He did. Yeah, yeah. He said he'd go get in the car and warm up during the barrel race, and it was in between. And, and they built a big fire, if you can imagine, a big fire in the heading box. He said nobody complained about it, you know. And but, right out behind the chute, they had a big fire twice as big as a car. Now, everybody stood around when they wasn't roping. And I remember you cinched your horse up and got ready. And you rode in the box and you pulled your gloves and your coat off. And when you come back, your hands are so cold, you couldn't even unsense your horse. You got somebody that was there to unsense your horse for you. The ground had to be frozen solid, too. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Can you imagine this, Jimbo? I'm sorry to catch yeah, you off fine. there. Yeah. 
the barrel racers, the grounds frozen solid at the first national finals. Steer roping, they had the team roping with it and the barrel racing, so can you hardly imagine barrel racers these days running on completely frozen ground? Right, right. Ain't gonna happen. The barrel racers wanted, I read somewhere the barrel racers wanted to rope at Dallas, or wanted to go at Dallas, and they, they didn't want them. And so they asked the steer ropers if they could come have their finals at, uh, with the steer roper, and they were glad to have them. They thought it would help their gait, you know, so they invited them with open arms, but the gait was shot when that co when you said there was more people there on Friday when they were breaking loose than there was during the roping, didn't you, Joe? Yeah, yeah. there was a lot more people watching then than there was in the grandstand because it was so cold that they just never watched this. Yeah. I don't know how the timers, because they just had a deal over the bucking shoots and, and, uh, and the front was all open. A friend of mine told me once that he had something to do with getting the first national final steer open together. Uh, Bill Harland, Wild Bill Har Harland from out there. Yeah, I don't know if he did. He probably did. I mean, he got it, I think, out there. The yeah, final yeah I think there. he was influential to get it moved out there to start with. Because, uh, but like I said, it was about 75 on Friday, and you got up Saturday morning, and it was raining and sleeping. You said show roped in gloves, didn't you, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Well, you dropped, you took yours off. I took mine off, but if I knew what I knew a few years later, I'd have worn them. You didn't know people could rope in gloves, did you? No. Never felt right to me, really. No, Never no. really felt right to me. Yeah. Well, that was quite a deal. Everybody had trouble looking at these times. Everybody had at least one steer. They were 50 on and 30, you know. I guess a lot of steers got up. You said they were pretty pretty rank cattle. Yeah, it was pretty rank and out there in the snow and the sleet. Uh, they wasn't liking it any better than we was. No. Yeah. <laughs> they wasn't going to lay it on that old cold ground, was it? No. But it was kind of a... a Tough roping them for sure in more ways than one. Well, I know if you'll look at the times and this and that, uh, Jim won it, her dad, and he was 50 something on a steer. Everett Shaw won second, he was 50 something on a steer. I was 50 something on a steer, and I don't remember now if I missed that one steer. Two loops, or or if he got up, I just never did get him tied. Well, you had a better day Sunday. You said uh, I think I, you placed in all three rounds on Sunday, didn't you? Yeah, I placed fourth in all three rounds and and uh, made the the best time on three head. Which they sold you in the Calcutta, and yeah, and somebody won some money at least. Yeah, because you had the best time on three. They sold the cow cut out for that each day? I think so. All right. I think they sold, sold everybody, and then they sold it on three head the first day, and then the next day they sold it on three head. They sold it every way they could. Hmm. Joe, just looking at this list of ropers, you had Everett Shaw, Schult Webster, Troy Fort, Sonny Davis, Clark McIntyre was out with an injury. Joe Snively, Jim Snively, Dale Smith. People think of Dale Smith as a cab roper more and poker chip, you know, but he roped steers pretty good and, and was a heck of a good team roper. He roped everything good. Yeah. He was a tough hand. Yeah. He was RCA president for years, Dale Smith was. Me and Joe were talking the other day, Cody. He made the finals in the steer roping, cab roping, and team roping. Who's ever done that? Maybe I mean, I know Trevor Brazil has, but who besides Trevor has ever done that? We'd have to do some searching on that. Yeah, I'm not, sure it's, that I I'm not sure it's ever happened. Trevor's a world champion in all three. Yeah, yeah, he that's, was. That's something else. Yeah, right that, that, that is unreal. He but. needs to uh, he needs to break his healing rope back out and try to win that healing yeah, world championship now. But anyway, then you had Harry Lynn from up here at Coffeeville and Charlie's dad. You know, Ch Harry actually won the first go around at the first national finals ever. 
and then Joe Bergevin, he was from up at Walla Walla, Washington. He won Pendleton that year. Dale Haverty, uh, Ponca City's Merle Davis, Leonard Block, and I don't know much about him, John Dalton, Buddy Groff, and Howard Haythorn. One of the Haythorns was in there. Well, there's, a, there's quite a few guys on that list where where this rodeo is a real family tradition. You mentioned Merle Davis yeah. making the first national finals. Of course, his son, Jim Davis, two-time world champion, and his son, Bryce Davis, NFR average winner. So, yeah. And they're all from this area. That's really I like the I like the family tradition part of a lot of this. But sadly, Joe, you're the last living contestant of all those ropers we named there. Uh, Isn't that uh, yeah. Hmm. Oh. But but they like you said, everybody had trouble. Just the conditions were 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 hard, you know. Good ropers like I mean, you know, great ropers. Eric Shaw was uh, 55 and just stuff like that you know everybody nobody got through that without having a lot of trouble with the cattle and the weather both but uh, um, that's quite an honor to make the first NFR for sure yeah uh, like I told you they can rope series for a thousand years and there'll never be another first NFR no we got we got one of those rare back numbers of Joe's on display right here right. in the museum I look at it all the time and tell all the uh, everybody else that that was the first you know NFR in Clayton New Mexico not yeah. Dallas, Texas, because yeah. you know they had the one in Clayton first. So, well, you got up Saturday. You, you got through Saturday, Joe, and then Sunday. Was it just as bad, or it wasn't snowing Sunday, was it? No, it wasn't as bad. It was still cold, but it wasn't sleeting and snowing yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. Huh. So it still wasn't any fun. What kind of ropes were you using no. back in, Joe? Nylon ropes. That's what everybody used to rope steers. Used to, when they when they started roping, they used grass ropes, and that was awful bad about breaking them. But when they got to nylons, you just never broke them. So, Joe, you made the first national finals steer roping. How, Jimbo? How did everybody end up at that first national final steer <clears throat> roping? Cody, the average winners were Jim Snively first, Everett Shaw second, Buddy Groff third. It's Joe Bergevin, fourth, and John Dalton, fifth. And that's they don't show a sixth. But uh, anyway, well, Sunday was a little better day for you. You you had, like I said, the fastest time on three head, placing all three rounds. And I guess Jim won it, so I guess it's a pretty good trip home. Yeah. We was all lucky and won something, so yeah. that was the main thing. Yeah. Never another poor day on the way home in the Snively rig, probably. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you said we touched on a while ago the field officials. Some people might want to know the, the first field judge or the uh, yeah, the field judge was Joe Crow Jr. in the steer roping. Joe Crow Jr. and Chuck Shepherds in the team roping and Carl Arnold. Uh, he was the head keeping the stock like yeah, he was, yeah. and I'm sure he pulled a bear. Yeah, well, he was an old, for those that don't remember, he was an old great steer roper from New Mexico, that, uh, world champion and stuff, and he yeah. was famous for all those match ropings against Bob Crosby. They had three or four of them. And yeah. Tried to deal, but he was a good old steer roper. But uh, Joe Crow Jr., Cody, for, if you don't familiar with him, he was a from right over here uh, west of Bartlesville, probably in Osage County is where he was raised. And he made the finals two or three times, didn't he, Joe? Or, I think so. Yeah. He was a real nice guy, what I remember of him. Yeah, he, he made the national finals. Yeah. I think he roped right here in Pahuska at one yeah, of the national finals. Yeah, I think finals, he did. So. I think he did. But anyway, well, that, like I say, that was, a, that was a good trip home. I was just three years old, but don't really remember it, but. Well, that national finals moved a lot, didn't it, Joe? On the steer yeah, roping for you, it did. Was out at Clayton for two years, then at uh, Laramie, Wyoming. What was it like roping up there in Laramie? It snowed. <laughs> <laughs> I roped in two national finals when there was snow and ice on the ground, and it was bad enough where. They couldn't get rid of all the snow, so they took a, a big loader and just piled it up in front of the 
the grandstand, but it wasn't near as cold. Wasn't as cold as the first one in Clayton? No, it wasn't. So you made Clayton, and then you made Laramie. Where did it move to after Laramie? Uh, Douglas, Wyoming. How was the weather there in Douglas? It was chilly, but it was nice. <laughs> nice and chilly. They just had it at Douglas for one year for some reason. They'd had it to two before that, you know, two years, two years. and Yeah. Well, they just had it at one year in Laramie, and then they went to Douglas. Then they come to Pahuska. I don't know, had it two or three years. And then went to... Uh, Vanita. Vanita. And then went back to Laramie for... I think he went to McAllister after well, Vanita. Uh, I was at Roping. Yeah, right that's then. kind of when you kind of quit there for a little while. And uh, then they had it back at Pahuska. And then had it back at Laramie. Yeah, yeah, and then Laramie, Laramie had it for several years. Yeah. Tell us about that first time you went to uh, Pendleton, Joe. That was when you won Pendleton in 64. In 64. Uh, it was funny. We got in there oh, two days before and were riding around John Pogue and Don McLaughlin and this and that, and we rode right by the cattle. You could look right over the fence. We was on the racetrack, and uh, and I told them, I said, right there's my steer, number 10, the first one. And I drank. <laughs> How'd you I, do? I tied him in 13, one to go around. That's a fast run at Pendleton today at 13. 13 will win you money at Pendleton right now. Yeah. Yep. So, what do you remember? What you tied the other ones in? Or I was twenty and twenty three, I think, on the last one. Yeah, but it was enough to win the average. Yeah. Well, well, you were the only guy to win Laramie three years in a row. Schultz won it several times, but he didn't win it consecutively. Schultz won it three years in a row. He won it two years and then skipped a year or two right. and won it the third time and Laramie was good to me uh, I won it in 61 won the national finals in 61 at Laramie and then won the jackpot in 62 and 63 so you won four good ropings there in three won, years yeah I won you probably liked Laramie then didn't you yes, that's I called did. the Laramie quad fecta right there and, yeah. and when I pulled through there going to Penland I took my hat off to it <laughs> well you should have uh, Laramie was a good town to you yeah absolutely so, let's talk about those old ropes again uh, those old nylon ropes these guys don't know how good they have it today with these ropes that feel good those old nylons weren't that didn't feel all that good did they most of them no uh, they was either way too stiff or they were so soft that you couldn't even use them for whale ropes. Yeah. Well, I remember Jim putting them in the oven. What was that for? Uh, we cooked the ropes. Soften and, them uh, up? And it would soften them up a little bit. Yeah. And then I remember him stretching them to a tree, Cody. They'd throw a chain around a tree with an S hook on it and hook that car to it and pull it just as tight as they could pull it and just leave it. Did you buy them ready to rope with, or did you have to tie your own ropes off? Uh, either way, you could you could buy them. That was already fixed up. But I remember one time years ago, my dad bought a, a whole roll. The rope felt good, so he bought a whole roll. And he had to tie loops in them. Do you guys use uh, leather burners back then or rawhide burners? or uh, Leather. Leather. A little different than nowadays. Well, they never even had rawhide. I mean, they had rawhide, but nobody used them. Nobody it used it. It was all leather. And when you got one of those good-feeling ropes, the one you really liked, you, you, it would last you several years, wouldn't it, Joe? Oh, yeah. I bought two ropes at Laramie one year off a... Of Buddy Cockrell, and I bought one for myself and one for my brother, and 
I made an Irish dip, two ropes for 10, 12 years. Is that the one you and Don McLaughlin shared? Yeah. Yeah, Don come by and felt my rope and swung it around and then he got ready to rope and I looked, my rope was gone and Don was using it. We used it all year, the same rope. Yeah, just trade rope back for it. You know, nowadays there's some guys, they use a different rope right, every right. every run sometimes. Yeah, it's just so. totally different. Yep. And, and that, that takes me back to when you said uh, Ben Johnson during the, it was, I guess during Ben Johnson rode a rope and why Ben Johnson came out to the house to have Everett Shaw, who was staying with us, to splice his rope. He thought it was just a little short or something, didn't he? Yeah, it was a little short to tie the stairs, and Ben come out and uh, Harry Carey Jr. come out with him. Huh. But that's something. I think I was probably 14 or 15 then. Yeah. Harry had much to say, or he just sat there and watch? Oh, he did a lot of talking. Did he? Did he do any roping? No. I never did see him rope. There he is right above your head. Yeah. Just doing a little talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What right. about what about when you when you made the finals here in Pahuska, Oklahoma? Tell us a little bit about that. Well I don't know, you don't rope as good in your hometown. They've always said that, but I won to Ben Johnson and won the finals here the one time. And one of the years here, I remember you, not to bring up any bad memories, but I remember you had 35 tie your last steer in and, and missed him two loops. Yeah, I grew a steer that uh, from my last one that my horse was getting side bones and he couldn't run to the right real hard. And this other boy had roped him and he run down the middle of the arena not very hard and he run right down the right hand side of the arena and run just as hard as I'd have ever run a steer and I had to reach for him it was my fault I missed him that happens that, that let Don McLaughlin win it I remember that yeah he was telling us half the rope how lucky he was that for you to to have done that, you know, it was the only way he was going to win it. What makes you think, why has there been so many great ro ropers and rodeo hands come from this Osage County area? What do you attribute that to? I don't really know back then, or several years, there wasn't a lot of ropers from these other other states and they never practiced as much as what they did and one thing we never had the cattle and this and that to tie a lot of steers at home and these guys Jim Davis said I never broke loose from a steer I tie everything I throw a rope at and like a Shote Webster's one of the better ropers and he told me years ago he said what do you practice for I said well make yourself better and help your horse he said you're doing the same thing at the rodeo practicing just make a better run every time you practice you said that uh he, uh, you roped a lot more, tied a lot more cattle at the rope than you ever did at home, didn't you? Oh, oh yeah. I was lucky if I tied one or two steers a week. Yeah, at home. At home. And that's the way it was growing up at my house. It yeah. was a rare privilege I mean, for yeah. my dad to say, hey, won't you uh, undo your breakaway and tie this one down? Right, right. Yeah. And some people did shoat practice a lot. That's what made him so tough. Everett Shaw practiced a lot and tied a lot of cattle and stuff. And that's what made him so tough. Boy, those guys were hard to beat, weren't they, Joe? Those four, when they were in their prime. And they all had good horses. And Yeah, they had good horses. And, and of course, you always had a score back when we roped. 
and now they rope lap and tap and rope a lot littler cattle. Right. As I said, that steer at Cheyenne, uh, this black horse would weigh about 1260, and this steer was just as tall as he was and just as wide. This steer would have weighed nine and a half to a thousand pounds. Well, they've always had big steers at Cheyenne, but not that big in the recent years. Well, this was just a bigger steer, but he was in the draw. He was lucky you got by him, tied him in 18. Yeah. Or that steer was unlucky that he drew. Drew Joe Joe's black Island. horse. Yeah. One of the two. Yep. Yeah. Well, how about when you won the uh, Ben Johnson here, Joe? What do you remember about that? Well, my first steer ducked back to the to the left and around, and I roped him. I've always been lucky. If a steer moved to the left, I could always rope one. I never missed a steer that moved back to the left on me. And I was 20-something on the, my next three steers. And well, you was, 20, you was 19 on your last steer. I remember that in the short go. Yeah. I think you were 22 and 20 in between that. But. And I was 20-something on my first steer. And uh, and really be truthful, nobody roped that good and this and that. I won it by a pretty good margin. Yeah, Sonny Wright was setting pretty good going into the third that last year, but he went out of it, and you had a lot of time to time in. Cody, the thing I remember about that Ben Johnson when he won it, of course, he had huge crowds back then. You know, grandstand was full, bleachers were full, everybody sitting on the fence. And the Floyd Watts was the announcer. And I remember him saying when Joe rode in the box, I know you folks want to cheer, but let's be quiet till Joe finishes his tie and gets back on his horse. We sure don't want to scare his horse. Well, that didn't do a bit of good. Just as soon as that rope went around the horn neck, that grandstand mm -hmm. erupted, you wouldn't believe it. And, uh, and it was just a huge loud. And, all, and I really believe that that's the loudest ovation that that old rope Marine's ever heard before or since. You they know. heard it all the way in Ponca City. Probably. It was loud. Well, there's nothing better than a hometown boy. Right. Taking home the championship against the very best in the world you're roping against. And you'd won third there. How many times did you say you won third there? Uh, I think five times. Yeah, so you'd been that close and just hadn't break, break and you'd win, win in every other rope and like say you won Laramie three times but you just never got the breaks here at Puska to win it and That's finally right. did. What were the entry fees back then, Joe, at these ropings? Uh, they were very different. Pahuska back then was 500 and I think when uh, Hyde Merritt and and uh, can't even think of his name. His announcer up there, Eddie Hanna. Eddie Hanna, and they ended up being. I think Laramie right then was two hundred fifty, but they wanted another roper and never had another one, so they asked me if I'd rope. That's when you was what seventeen or something, sixteen or seventeen. Uh. I was probably about 16 then. Yep. Hmm. Joe, what'd you do when you went not rodeoing around here for a living? Do what? When you went not roping and rodeoing, what'd you do for a living around here? Well. Or, do, or, or did you just rodeo? Uh, I just rodeoed all summer and then went to school in the wintertime. And I was lucky enough, my dad let me go my junior and senior year to Pendleton. I took a week off from school and went to Pendleton. Did you drive up there? Yeah. How long did it take you to drive to Pendleton back then, Joe? Well, a day and a half. Uh, 
In 64, when left, me and John Polk left Penland, and we drove home, and we drove pretty fast. And it was uh, it like 10 miles, been from Penland to Pahuska, 1,900 miles. Pretty good little haul. That's a long ways. Well, we pulled in Monday morning for uh, my brother got up to go to work pulled in out of the house and and his wife said well there's Joe and Polk and my brother said no it can't be because they can't make it that way I remember that I was just little and I remember seeing that but saddle in the tr trunk of your car it's not nice to say and this and that but the car I had then I drive it about a hundred five miles an hour pulling two horses and John Polk would drive it about 115 <laughs> So you made it home in pretty good time. Yes, we did. For the day. You had to get home, show everybody all there, all your I, stuff. I remember you going out there that morning and looking at that saddle. That's the saddle that's here in the museum, the uh, Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum. And I remember looking at that saddle. And it was sure bad, pretty. bad thing about it, we stopped at Don McLaughlin's and shaved and went and eat, and then we come on home. Back in them days, Joe, you know how Pendleton's always been on, on a grass field. Were there a lot of ropings on grass, or was Pendleton special about that even back then? Uh, Pendleton was more special back then, but there were several places that they roped on grass. I never did. Oh, I did too. At High Ends, Nebraska, uh, they just come in and mowed it and raked it raked the grass off and we roped on grass up there. But Penland was a football field is what it is. And they come in and put a little gravel on it where like, you don't tear up the grass as bad. How about when you won that Penland that second time? You said those cattle were pretty smart. Yeah, they'd been Pendlin got the cattle and they leased them out to team roping clubs and this and that. And some of the steers, the further you followed him to get a good pro, worse he got. You wanted to pro just as soon as you got to him. And nobody could figure it out, and I never figured it out until my last steer, how bad that you just need to throw just as soon as you got in range. Because I was sitting eighth or ninth when I went in there, and I told everybody, I said, if I win the go around, I'm gonna win a bunch of the average. And I tied the steer in 14, and uh, I rode back down there by the box, and I said, I've won a bunch of the average. And they kept going. They had a lot of time to tie the steer in their last steer. And they kept following them to get the good throw, the cinch. Well, it got worse. The cattle, some of them cattle put their head between their front legs. They were so smart. Hmm. And that's the first year that I've ever been to a roping that uh, my fur, all my steers run to the right. I mean, just right around. If you've been there, a lot of people sit there right over the racetrack, and he just stuck right around them, all three steers. They can go right a long ways there in Pendleton, too, it seems like. Oh, yeah. But if one decides to go left, they can go left a long ways there, too. So. Yeah. But I'm like you. I like I like that left eye way better than the right eye. Yeah. Any day of the week, any day of the week, it's a lot better. Well, that was a good trip home then after winning Pendleton. That made that 1,900 miles a little shorter, didn't it? Yes, it did. I think that'd be a long trip home if you didn't do any good. It's a long <laughs> trip there, but it's longer trip home. Yeah. If you don't win nothing. Right. I've been there a few times. I've been there a few times. <laughs> It is a long trip home, long trip up there. But, you know, it's a great rodeo, and they treat their cowboys good up in the northwest, it seems like, at all those rodeos. 
Man. Yeah, it's a good rodeo. I always liked it. And when I first went to Pendleton, uh, the chutes was on the other end, on the east end of the arena. And if you grew up in a slack, the sun was shining off of the grandstand right in your eyes. You couldn't hardly even see your steer. So bright. And then, I guess I roped her two years, and then they moved it to the other end and made it a lot better. Well, some of the old pictures I've seen there, there, there wasn't any grass, too. So I don't know when they brought the grass in. I don't know that's grass when I first went. Right, there. right. But like Ben Johnson roping that cab up there, that's on just arena dirt. Yeah. You know, I've heard tell of a place there called the Letter Buck Room. I wouldn't know anything about it, but I've heard tell of it. Yeah. You ever heard of that, Joe? Yeah. It was under the big grandstand. He probably don't know nothing about it either. So. Right, yeah. right. I just heard some tale of it. Right. Well, I'll be truthful about it. I went in there one time and looked around. <laughs> <laughs> just to see what see what the hoopla was about. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think I might have that one time, too, just to yeah. see what it was about, yeah. too. So. Joe, some of your good friends, did you rope it like Don McLaughlin? I know you're good friends with Don. He was quite a roper, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Probably as a smarter roper than ever rodeo because he was always thinking and he never made, ever made a mistake. Yep. And That's what it's about, to win, it seems I like. Say, I seen him rope a calf at Cheyenne and figure eight both front legs and he run down there. I did it. I do not know. But he come out with the leg and play second in the calf rope and earth giant. Nobody else would have just went and got on their horse and Well, well uh Clark McIntyre and all those guys I always heard that Clark if he needed to tie a steer in eighteen to win, he'd tie him in seventeen. You know, he just barely, just every time, he just like yeah. he had a clock in his head. Like one of them good pool players, he only plays as good as he has to. Don't yeah. Didn't That's want everyone what, to know how good he really was. Yeah. And Everett Shaw, he, he'd never miss a steer hardly, did he, Joe? Everett Shaw, he'd never miss a steer hardly, would he? He could rope more cattle than anybody that, that roped. Yeah. And like I said, you, you had a score. If if you found a score that was 15 foot, it was usually short because they scored the cattle further than that. And, and unless you just went to a arena that was just too small. I think McAllister was, or uh, yeah, McAllister was 15. Uh, I don't know, but you just never, you found a few scores that was 12, but most of them was 15 to 18 to 20 foot. You, you went to Cheyenne, and it's 30 foot, 20 foot at Pendleton. But Pendleton was a little different because the main thing at Pendleton, you was back behind your cattle, and they run them down. You could be late. But your horse was running as hard as he could he could run when you crossed the line. I never could picture that in my head what everyone was talking about on the how Pendleton ran their cattle off of that hill and yeah. on, down that lane and you know, they got someone sitting on the post. When you nod your head they say he's yeah. out. Yeah. And that means they turned him out of one of the back pins. Yeah, and you then, couldn't even see the steer and uh and there would be four or five people run them out, you know, one at a time. But if you got a young guy, he'd bring him out running just as hard as he could be running the steer. And the next one, he would be a little slower. But you could just wait and could be late. You could miss the barrier a foot and a half, but it never hurt you. Yeah, it never seemed. I, I just let... 
I'd see that stare out of the corner of my eye come by me right yeah. there, and then I'd see him out in front of me, and then when I went, oh, yeah. I never I never slowed up. I just, huh, I no. dropped a hammer when I went and just mm. went as hard as you could. Yeah, your horse was running just as hard as he could run when he crossed the line. It's not like sitting in a box dead. It takes a little while for a horse to get his speed, but there, like I said, he could be running as fast as, as he could run. You don't see very many people pull unless they start way too early there. You won McAllister, Joe. Uh, what was that like? That was a different kind of roping too, wasn't it? I mean, just the atmosphere and inside the walls. and Yeah. It always scared me. Those trustees scared me when I was a kid. And one of the years I went down there, it was all open. So you could nod... If steer moved, you could ride. And then two or three years later, they had a box that wasn't six foot long. Yeah. Your horse dagged your head was over the barrier. You couldn't move until he, you could see past his hip out the gate. Yeah. And I've roped there before that. The boxes are kind of underneath that. The stadium there where yeah. the where all the convicts sit behind you, for folks that don't know where they're talking about McAllister, we used to have a prison rodeo down there, and the prisoners would do all the rough stock events and specialty events, and the PRCA Cowboys would do the timed events, steer roping, calf roping. Bulldogging. Bulldogging. You're, you're right about that. And uh, they did all kinds of crazy convicts events down well, there. I, I, well, as a kid, little old kid, I remember, you know, we kept the horses. They took care of your horses and stuff, didn't they? They're, what was they call that, the mule barn? Yeah. And those trustees running around there, and they, they scared me, you know, because I wasn't used to being around convicts, you know. And, and uh, all those trustees, but they were nice, nice guy. I mean, you know, nice enough people, but, uh, but it was just kind of uh, alarming to me to be around all those guys. Well, it's, it's a really, really unique place because right up in the corner behind the roping boxes and, and bucking chutes and stuff, they got a big caged area with the, with the razor wire all the way around, and that's where they put all, all the uh, inmates that are in the McAllister, Oklahoma State Prison right there. Yeah. And the, I, I, I suppose the trustees get a set up there and watch. And then on the other corner of the stadium, there's, there's a, a band playing in a in a yep. cage and it, it was the prison rodeo band playing during the rodeo so. that that band used to come around to Lenapaw and Benita and all those places didn't it Joe all the yeah. local rodeos yeah I remember them well they were good just real unique I think I'm not sure if they even still have that rodeo anymore I think they just quit having it here just a few years ago right I know it went away from a PRCA rodeo for a while, but I'm not sure if they're even still having the prison rodeo down in McAllister. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think they are. I don't know if they ever had it after the riot, did they, or did they? Oh, yeah. They, okay. they, they had it all the way into the 2000s. Oh, did they? Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. They had the finals there a couple times, I know, too. The national yeah. final steel roping was there a yeah. couple times. Yeah. Huh. Well, after you got done roping, Joe, what, what, uh, what'd you do? What'd you do? Did you work on some ranches around here? Or? Yeah, I worked on several ranches until it was time to go to practice and, and get ready to rope again, get your horse in shape and you back in shape. And you roped in the seniors roping too, some, didn't you, Joe? Yeah. For two or three years or something. That's where I got acquired, that's where I got acquainted with Joe. He would show up to the some of the Osage ropings, and he would show up to some senior ropings, and he was riding a big old tall kind of a uh, running looking black horse, and he had this little black hat he's wearing on today, and uh, I didn't know Joe from nothing, and I saw he came out there and kind of had the old timey loop going, but that last swing was right over his head, and I never seen him miss a steer, and he won the majority of the ropings I saw him rope in as a as a young man, and he was getting a little bit older right there in the senior ropings he he won the majority of them i watched him rope in one of the best ropers i ever saw at the time for sure it always stuck in my mind watching you rope joe yeah and that's just like how the cattle has changed you know i roped for several years in 13 as fast as i could tie a steer in i had two that i should have tied in 11 but I never tied until I was 55. I never tied 
I tied two steers in 12. That's how like, much littler and shorter the scores and stuff are now. Or you just get better with age like fine wine too, Joe. That could <laughs> yeah, be it. I doubt that. I've always heard that old age and treachery overcomes youth and enthusiasm yeah. just about every time. And it does seem that way in the steer open a lot of times. These same old guys that, you know, was beating me when I was young and my dad and everybody else, they're still beating everybody today to, you know, this day, 30-something, 40, 40 yeah. years later. I would have liked to have seen Sonny Davis rope the cattle they rope today and stuff in his prime. I wonder what he'd tie him in, Joe. He would be faster than what anybody's tied one in. Yep. Because Sonny Davis, like I said, he had a million dollar arm in the 60s, and that wasn't even heard of then. And uh, you let Sonny Davis beat himself. Yeah, he went for the go around every time. He went for the go around every time. He never, he never did slow down. Boy, he, he was something to watch, Cody. He was big and what six four, probably two twenty, and athletic, and he could handle those steers' legs like his calf legs, you know, and stuff. I know he, he had went out of it. And he was just carrying one rope, and he missed his steer. Build another loop and tied the steer in twenty <laughs> with two loops, and he had to build one to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I, he was fun to watch because he was a threat to tie one in 11 back then, you know, when the, oh, yeah. when nobody was tying them in 11. What are you doing nowadays, Joe? What have you been doing nowadays? Oh, me and my wife's got a few cattle and this and that, and take care of them. I heard you're selling your own beef now. Yeah. Yeah, my wife's selling some beef. How does anybody get a hold of you to get it, any of that good beef? Call us. Just give them a call. <laughs> yeah. Call up here to the museum. We'll pass. We'll pass the information along, or get a hold of Jimbo on Facebook. Yeah. We'll get. We'll get you some of this good. You're living in Kansas now. Yeah. Kansas raised beef, right on the Oklahoma line. That's yeah. the best place for beef, really. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, you got anything else for him, Jimbo? Well, not really. I mean, we've covered a lot. We, we could talk all day about the little ropings and ropers and stuff, but uh, we really appreciate him coming down. Pretty good little drive down from his house, but would encourage anybody to come through the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum and see Joe's display, all his back numbers, and the belt buckle, and the saddle he won at Pendleton that first time, and just all that. And We just really appreciate him coming down sharing this with us. So like I said, first national finalist, or the, la uh, the last survivor of the first national finalist steer roping. Last mm -hmm. surviving contestant. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Hey, Joe, a lot of people's going to watch this. Hopefully, hopefully some young up-and-comers are going to watch this. You've been everywhere. You've done everything. You've roped everything. You've done it all. You've seen it all. You got any advice for some of these up-and-coming cowboys? I don't know. You have to practice a lot. And that's the main thing is practice. Practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody once said it's all luck, but the more you practice, the luckier you get. I've heard sweat. Uh, you know, and there's, there's so many people that rope a lot close to the same and this and that. It was good but you have to be lucky with it some people are winners and some people's not rather be lucky than good any day right. that's Absolutely. right but if but if you're if you're good you make luck i understand what you're saying yes sir well joe thank you for coming down all the way from your house up in kansas we sure appreciate it mm -hmm. He's one of the legends around here, one of the true cowboys of the Osage, Joe Snively right here. We sure appreciate you coming down. Well, thank you for having me.
And if anybody's interested in this man's career, we got a whole huge display to nothing but this great cowboy right here, right here in the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma. Come learn all about him. You might even see him hanging out here one of these days. You never know when Joe's going to show up, be hanging out in the museum, checking some stuff out. Joe, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. All right, Jimbo. It's been another good one. Been another good one. I think uh, we uh, really got lucky with Joe. He was one of the top hands. He was a legend in the steer rope, a living legend. We're lucky that he's your uncle. Yeah, yeah. I, he taught me a lot. I'm proud to be kin to him, for sure. We're real proud of him around here, too. Everybody is. Mr. Joe Snively, thanks for coming, man. Thank you for having me. All right. See everybody next week right here at Cowboys of the Osage podcast.